Hello friends, I am Tim Saxton from White Horse Media. As you know, God has His true believers throughout the various religious persuasions in our world. Many of these sincere individuals worship Him unaware that their denomination or institution is actually teaching things contrary to Scripture and against Christ. The sermon you are about to watch covers a very sensitive but vitally important topic of Bible prophecy. As such, the scriptures often make pointed remarks about some who claim to be Christians but who are not. Though the Bible is clear, God does not hold people accountable for what they don't know and have no opportunity of knowing. He is a God of truth and wants His people throughout the world to understand what truth is. Jesus said in John 4.24 that we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. In John 14.6 he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in John 8.32 he states, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It is our prayer that you will be blessed as you listen to this message, realizing that it is not designed to speak against one's individual faith, but to reveal Bible truth on this important topic. Let's have a word of prayer and we will start the message. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath morning. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come together and to worship and to study your word. And we pray for the blessing of your spirit upon us today as we open the word in Jesus' name. Amen. The year was 1936. And the first transatlantic air service started between Europe and the United States. But transatlantic, transatlantic air service did not start with airplanes. People were flying in something else. I don't know if any of you recognize these. We call them blimps today. In those days, they were called zeppelins. Uh, <clears throat> they were airships. And the first passenger travel across the Atlantic in air, in, in, by air was with airships. And the airships were, were very nice, very luxurious. Um, kind of reminds the Titanic. They were very beautiful on the inside. Here's one. The most famous one was the Hindenburg. Here's what it looked like on the inside. You can tell it was very modern, even by today's standards. The people that rode in them were the rich and the famous and those who could afford the tickets. They said it was a very smooth ride because you would, a passenger would get on the airship and they would go to their stateroom and they would be sitting there and they might ask one of the crew members, when are we going to take off? Only to find they were already flying because you just did not even notice. It was so smooth. It took some time to get across the Atlantic, um, but even a few days was much faster than the ships of those days. The Hindenburg was the most famous of all the airships. It was made in Germany. It flew in its first season 10 round, trip, round trips across the Atlantic between Europe and the United States or Europe and Brazil. On its second season, it was crossing the Atlantic. And it was a rather uneventful crossing, but as they were nearing New Jersey where they were going to land, the radio report came and said, do not land yet, it's too windy. You need to, to hold and wait. And so the crew took the Hindenburg and they went around New Jersey waiting to hear when it would be safe to come into land. A couple of hours passed past their landing time when they received word that said, it is safe to land now. The winds have died down. But by this time, the crew had allowed the ship to drift quite some distance. And so it took some time to get back to their landing field. When they got there, they come to the, they approach their landing field, and instead of landing right away, the ship takes a circular course around the landing field so that those in the ship can go outside and they can wave to their friends down below as if, look at me, I'm on the Hindenburg, I'm on this great airship. Look as we're waving down at you down below. So they took the circular path around the landing field. And finally, at 7 o'clock that evening, they started to bring the ship in for a landing. At 7, it was actually 721, when somebody noticed, while the ship was still 300 feet or about 100 meters in the air, somebody noticed a fire on the back of the airship. Now, those airships were filled with flammable gas, and so 
When the fire started, all of a sudden it was this. The ship just exploded in an inferno. In the fire that ensued, some chose to jump to their deaths rather than burn alive as the ship came crashing down. A total of 36 people died in the fiery catastrophe and thus ended passenger travel with lighter-than-air ships. It was a ship on course for disaster. Had it landed at its normally scheduled time, those who died may have lived. Had the crew not strayed so far from their landing spot, they might have been able to land before the fire started. Even when they were coming in for a landing, time was wasted by passing around the airfield and circling around so people could wave at their friends. How quickly would the crew have worked to save passengers and to bring the ship to a landing, a quick landing, had they known that everything was about to be burned up? Our world is a lot like that airship. Time is running out, and everything in our world likewise is going to be burned up. In the scriptures, the Bible gives a specific warning for earth's final hour. We find it in Revelation 14 and verse 9. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. One of the most stern warnings found in Scripture is for those living at the end of the world not to take the mark of the beast. Modern society and the greater Christian world have often speculated, speculated what the mark of the beast could mean. Is it barcodes? Is it plastic money? Is it retina or finger scans? What could it be and who is the beast or the antichrist power of Scripture. Is he here already? And if so, how is he manifesting himself to deceive so many? Today, we want to look at who is the beast power of Scripture? Who is the Antichrist power? And how is the world going to wonder after them? Revelation 13, 1 tells us, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. Now in Scripture, beasts often, often represent kingdoms or powers on the world field. In this description, we find a beast that looks like a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a nondescript beast that has ten horns. Now, where else in Scripture, because the Bible always interprets itself, where else in Scripture do you find the same thing? A lion, a bear, a leopard, and a nondescript beast with ten horns. Well, there's only one answer, and that's in the book of Daniel. Daniel was having a dream, the Bible says, and he saw four great beasts come up from the sea, diverse or different from one another. They were a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a nondescript beast with ten horns. Now, we understand from history who, the beast rep who these beasts represented. They represented the same kingdoms or powers of the image of Daniel 2. And those were in history Babylon, representing the lion with wings. In fact, if you go back and look at ancient history, Babylon, in Babylon, they, they depicted there in Babylon at the time a lion with wings. Persia was the bear, Medo-Persia. The Grecian Empire under Alexander and the Great was the leopard. And then came the iron monarchy of Rome, pagan Rome. However, in Daniel's dream, he seems to focus on the last beast, the one with the ten horns. And he says in verse 7, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, terrible, exceedingly strong. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. So Daniel in his dream, he is seeing a new power develop out of the pagan Roman Empire. 
verse 21, it says, I was watching that same horn, this new power that develops, and it was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. It was fighting against the people of God. It was persecuting the people of God. He goes on to say, and this power would speak pompous words against the Most High and persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law and the saints would be given into his hands for a time and times and dividing of times. So, to clarify those characteristics, in Daniel 7, this power would speak words against the Most High, against God himself. It would persecute God's saints. It would think to change times and laws, and the saints are giving into his hands for what the Bible describes as a time, times, and dividing of time. A quick look in the Hebrew on the word time there will tell you that it stands for a biblical year. So you could say it's a year and two years and a half a year, or three and a half years, prophetic years. With that little bit of background of Daniel, let's move back to Revelation 13. And I saw one of his heads as if it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after this beast power. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. Now, 42 months is three and a half years, the same time period depicted in Daniel 7. Verse 7, And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When we compare Daniel and Revelation together, we find the identifying characteristics of these powers are one and the same. It is the same power in Daniel 7 as seen in Revelation 13. A power that speaks words against God, that blasphemes he, him, that persecutes his saints, that thinks to change times and laws, and has a set time, 42 prophetic months, or three and a half prophetic years. Now, in Revelation 12, 6, just to kind of clarify that, the Bible speaks of the time when a woman, representing a church, flees into the wilderness from the persecution, those who are persecuting her, and that she's there in the wilderness 1,260 days. Well, in Bible prophecy, in 1,260 days is the equivalent of 42 months or three and a half years. And of course, Ezekiel 4, 6 tells us that in prophecy, a day stands for a year. So then this persecuting power would reign for 1,260 years, after which it would receive a deadly wound. So I want to ask the question then, what power is it in history that arose out of pagan Rome that persecuted the saints of God and had a special reign of 1,260 years? that would blaspheme the name of God. What power is it? We find men such as Luther, Calvin, Wesley, and Knox correctly identified it because there's only one power that fits in history. That is the power of the medieval church, also known as the papacy or the Holy See. History records that, in fact, the papacy did persecute those who did not follow its teaching during the Dark Ages. It did attempt to change the law of God in the Ten Commandments found in your Bible. In fact, we are told that up to 50 million Christians were killed during the Dark Ages by Rome. From Church and Churches, we read, Out of the ruins of the Roman Empire, there gradually arose a new order of states whose central point was the Papal See. Daniel 7 correctly brings this out, a power that arises out of pagan Rome. From the book, from Haley's Bible Handbook, many of you may have heard of that, it's available in many Christian bookstores, it tells how millions lost their lives during this period of papal persecution. And why did they lose their lives? For possessing a Bible. If you owned a Bible, that was not authorized. If you repeated Bible text in your own language, because the official church language was Latin, that was not authorized. You could be burned at the stake. If you taught doctrines differ, differing from the Catholic faith, that was not authorized. You could be burned at the stake. Now, we read in Daniel 7 that the power would have the, 
this beast power would think to change times and laws. And we read here from the Ecclesiastical Dictionary, the Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. It's interesting, if you look at the Ten Commandments here, I don't know well, how well you can read that on the screen, but between the church commandments as taught by Roman Catholicism and the commandments you find in your Bible, your King James Version of the Bible, there are two different sets of commandments. Because in your Bible, it says the second commandment is, you shall not make graven images or fall down and worship them. However, in the Catholic version of the Ten Commandments, number two is gone and number ten is divided in two. You shall not covet your wife, your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet your neighbor's goods. So they still have ten commandments. The Catechism goes on to say, which is the Sabbath day. And here we find another attempt by this power to change God's Ten Commandments. It answers, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Sabbath? Because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. From an abridgment of the <clears throat> Christian doctrine, have you any other ways of proving the church has power to institute festivals of precept? Had she not had such power, she could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day of the week, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. It's interesting as we look in history and we see what the church did in fulfilling prophecy in attempting to change what God had put in his law. The Ten Commandment law comes to us from Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. It says, number four is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. The fourth commandment tell, points us back to creation as evidence of why we should keep the fourth commandment. For God is the creator of all things, and the Bible says on the seventh day, God rested after he had created man. The Bible goes on to teach us in Luke that Jesus' custom was he would go into the synagogue on the Sabbath day to read. Christ's custom was to worship on the Sabbath day. And in fact, Christ told his disciples, referring to the destruction of Jerusalem, which would take place after he had gone back to heaven, pray that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath. In essence, telling them, remember the Sabbath when I am gone. Many Christians think that Sunday is the day to worship in honor of the resurrection. But if we looked at the order of events, Jesus died on Friday afternoon. Jesus rose and went back to work on Sunday morning. Which day did he rest? He rested on the seventh day Sabbath. So even in death, we find Christ resting upon the Sabbath. In Acts 13, 42, we find the Gentiles begging the apostles to preach to them on the Sabbath. In fact, verse 44 says, almost the, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came to hear the word of God presented. In Isaiah 66, the Bible tells us that the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord. So shall your seed and your name remain, and it shall come to pass from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another that all flesh shall come and worship before me. So the Sabbath is taught in scripture from Genesis to Revelation from before there was sin till when there is no sin again yet we find that Satan worked through the church in the dark ages to change the Sabbath from Catholic Cardinal James Gibbons you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday the scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday so says James Gibbons a Catholic Cardinal the legal supremacy of the Pope began in A.D. 538 when there went into a, an effect a decree of Emperor Justinian making the Bishop of Rome head over all the churches and the definer of doctrine and the corrector of heretics. Exactly 1,260 years later, exactly on time with Bible prophecy, Napoleon's army march into Rome, take the Pope off his throne, and he dies in exile, thus a deadly wound is inflicted upon the papal power. In 1929, history records that Mussolini returned Vatican City to the papacy. And the American press carried the headlines of the day in speaking of the wound being healed. For the Vatican, being returned to the papacy, now gave it stately and kingly power once again. Verse 6 of Revelation 13 says, Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. 
And we ask the question, well, how does the papacy blaspheme? Mark 2, 7, the Bible tells us, why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive but sins but God only? So we could say that blasphemy, according to Scripture, is when we, man takes upon himself the prerogatives of God, including the ability to forgive sins. We could also say it is placing oneself in the place of God. From Ferris Ecclesiastical Catholic Dictionary, we read, The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted, he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the vicar of God. He is likewise the divine monarch and the supreme emperor and king of kings. When we take upon ourselves the prerogatives of God and say that the Pope is God on earth, that is blasphemy. In fact, in the encyclical letters of Pope Leo XIII, he says, We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Looking in history, Scripture teaches us in 1 John 1, 9 that Christ is the one who forgives our sins. In A.D. 12.15, the papacy changed this to say the Catholic priest will forgive your sins. Scripture teaches us in Hebrews 7.25 that Christ is our intercessor. The papacy teaches that the priest is our intercessor. Scripture teaches in 2 Timothy 3.16 that God's Word, the Holy Bible, is all inspired by Him and is given for our instruction. The papacy changes in 1545 and said, Tradition, not Scripture, is the rock on which the church is built. Scripture teaches us in Ephesians 2.8 that by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. The papacy says we obtain grace by receiving the sacraments. For everything that Christ does in teaching us about grace and salvation and our completeness in him, the dragon during the dark ages, that's why they're called dark, work through the papal power to bring in a substitute. The devil always works to bring a substitute for the truths of God. Whatever God says, Satan tries to bring a substitute for. Jesus really clarified it when he says, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. According to the Catechism, the Pope is known, as it says, in his official capacity as the vicar of Christ. The dictionary defines the word vicar as substitute, so then he is known as the substitute of Christ. Now, in the Bible, there's a word called antichrist. We've all heard the word. It comes from two Greek words. <clears throat> it comes from the Greek word antichristos, which comes from two Greek words. Anti, which means, and you can look this up in your Strong's, anti, which means substitution, and Christos, which is Christ or the Anointed One. Thus you have, when you look up in your Strong's Concordance, Antichrist or Antichristos, the substitute for Christ, truly the title the Pope has taken. Revelation 13, 18 says, Here is wisdom, let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, his number is 666. According to the Jesuit publication, Our Sunday, Vis Our Sunday Visitor, November 15, 1914, the title of the Popes of Rome is Vicarious Philae Dei. That is Latin and means Vicar of the Son of God. Of course, when we look at the Pope's title and we take the numerical equivalents and we add them up, we come to the number 666. Martin Luther said, Oh, how much pain it has caused me, though I had the scriptures on my side, that I should dare to make a stand alone against the Pope and hold him forth as Antichrist. Revelation 13, 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now let's look at that text closely because we're going to see it again in just a minute in a different place. Revelation 17, 3, And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple. All right? There's a reason why the Bible describes her as arrayed in purple. The color of the woman. The color of the church. And scarlet color. And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And the angel said to me, I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the Lamb of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Notice here in verse 8, 
Revelation 17.8 is almost a mirror text to Revelation 13.8. For in both of them, they're talking about all the world will wander after the beast whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. And notice here they describe the beast in three phases. The beast that was, the beast that is, the beast that shall. There are three phases of the papal power in history. The beast that was, is, shall. The beast that was, the dark ages, the beast that is wounded, the beast that shall restored. Revelation 17, 9, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. Now, in Revelation 17, 9, once again, we have a parallel with Revelation 13, because Revelation 13 also said, here is wisdom. And it went right on to, to tell us about 666. Revelation 17, 9 says, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, in Scripture, what do mountains symbolically represent? Symbolically, mountains represent kingdoms. For the reference for that is Jeremiah 51, verse 24 and 25, Daniel 2, verse 35, 44, and 45. What seven kingdoms are they? Well, we know the first four. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, the four ancient kingdoms of history. Who are the last three of the seven kingdoms? The beast that was, the beast that is, the beast that shall. The way Revelation 17 describes the three phases of the papal power. The beast during the dark ages, the beast wounded, the beast restored. Seven kingdoms symbolically. Now, how many of you have heard of the Ark of the Covenant? What does the Ark of the Covenant represent in Scripture? Whose throne is on the Ark of the Covenant? The throne of God, all right? What is on either side of the Ark of the Covenant? Angels. What are the angels made of? Gold. What color is Christ's throne in Revelation chapter 20? Nope, it's not gold. The great white throne. All right. So we go to this picture here. We have the Pope sitting on a great white throne surrounded by two golden angels. It's interesting that symbolically we look at the kingdoms, that we, we, the seven kingdoms, but literally, so we have a symbolic interpretation, but literally Rome sits on seven mountains, or actually across from them, they're hills. Rome sits across from seven hills. It's not actually, the Vatican is not part of the seven hills. They call Rome the eternal city. Now let's ask the question, where is the real eternal city? Anybody know? New Jerusalem in heaven. That's the real eternal city. What city on earth was supposed to model the real eternal city? Jerusalem over in, in the Old Testament, Jerusalem and Palestine and Israel was supposed to be a model of the one in heaven, all right? Now it's interesting when you study Jerusalem over in Israel also is surrounded by seven mountains or seven hills, okay? Because it was modeling the one in heaven. But the devil comes along who always substitutes everything that God does and says, I will use Rome and I will have, it's also surrounded by seven hills and I will call it the eternal city and I will put my person there sitting in his temple, sitting on a great white throne surrounded by two golden angels. In the book Early Writings, there is a description given of a vision of heaven, and it says Mount Zion was just before us, and on the mount was a glorious temple, and about it were seven other mountains. See, everything that God has, Satan tries to make a substitute for. That's why in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, it says, Who exalt, opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. During the Protestant Reformation, as thousands and tens of thousands were discovering justification by faith and were streaming into this new truth, Jesuit priest Francisco Ribera says, we've got to come up with something to take the heat off the papacy because everybody's calling it Antichrist. Let's come up with a new interpretation of prophecy. So they did that, and they wrote it, and they put, they put it out, and it had some effect in Europe in the 1500s. Didn't have much in Protestantism until the 1800s when Margaret MacDonald had a vision um, that supported Rivera's prophecies, false prophecies. Later, John Darby takes her vision and this information, and he gives it to Schofield, who puts it in his reference Bible, and over the next hundred years, almost all the Protestants adopt Francisco Ribera's Jesuit 
theology to take the heat off of the Pope and make somebody else like Antiochus Epiphanes, make him the Antichrist so people are not seeing the real truth. Revelation 13, 3 says, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can make war with him? Last month on CNN, maybe some of you saw this. In March of 2018, they had a series running called Pope, the Most Powerful Man in History. Pope, the most powerful man in history. Who is like the beast? Who can make war with him? Revelation 13, 3, And all the world wondered after the beast. Are we seeing all the world wondering today? Since 1929, at least 180 nations have established diplomatic relations with the Vatican. And those without diplomatic relations at least have official or unofficial communication channels. There are only four nations left on earth that are excluded. They are North Korea, Bhutan, the Maldives, and China. However, according to Vatican Radio, China and the Vatican are working towards, progressing towards normalization of relations. Revelation 13 carries a report of a second beast that comes up out of the earth having two horns like a lamb and speaking like a dragon. A power that would come up about the time that the wound is incurred upon the first beast. Around 1798, it would have two horns like a lamb. It would be a lamb-like power. It would be a Christ-like power because a lamb is symbolic for Jesus. It would be a Christian type of nation. And we have to ask the question, what nation came up around the end of the 1700s that was a Christian nation that, that <clears throat> did the most to spread the gospel around the world of our day. There is only one power that could be, and that's the United States of America. The place of religious liberty, the land of the free, and the home of the brave. When you travel around the world, there is no country like the United States. Those of you that have traveled know this. Anywhere you go, there is no place like the United States. The Lord has blessed this country so much, he has protected it in a very special way. And the United States has been the country that has been foremost in proclaiming the gospel to every nation on earth. But prophecy predicts a change is coming. At the end of time, this Christian or Christ-like nation turns and speaks now not like a lamb, but like a dragon. And a dragon is symbolic of Satan. How would they do such a thing only by repudiating the principles of our great constitution? It goes on to say, And this power causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So the second beast representing the United States abandons its founding principles at the end of time and points people back to the first beast or papal Rome. In so doing, it is helping to reestablish the supremacy of Rome's past. Pope Francis came to visit the United States and uh, he spoke before a joint session of Congress and it wasn't just a joint session of Congress, it was the Supreme Court, the President's Cabinet, members of the military, in essence the whole U.S. government is there to be addressed by the Pope and he says the United States and this Congress have an important role to play in furthering his agenda. After he meets with the U.S. Congress, he goes out on the balcony to greet the American people. And we ask the question, now where have we seen this picture before? The Pope comes out on the balcony of the Capitol to greet the people. Where else does he do that? In Rome, where the Pope comes out on the balcony of the Capitol to meet the people. And is it the same type of Capitol? It is a Capitol building facing an obelisk at the other end where the Pope comes out and greets the people. And you see the man of sin moves from one Capitol building to another Capitol building. Some will say it could never happen. The United States would never do something like that. But let's remember what others have said could never happen. Lee DeForest, 1957, American radio pioneer and inventor of the vacuum tube, says to place a man on the moon in a rocket and to place a man in a rocket and project him to the moon and return him to Earth constitutes a wild dream worthy of Jules Verne. I am bold enough to say that such a man-made voyage will never occur. Scientific American, January 2, 1909, said the automobile has practically reached the limits of its development. Steve Ballmer, USA Today, April 30, 2007, says there's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. Over and over in history, 
Predictions are made of such things that will never happen only to find the very same thing happens immediately thereafter. Where are we in time today? The second beast causes or pressures the world to follow the first beast. I saw this article in the New York Times. I had to throw it up there, March 24 of this year, 2018, talking about America first bears a new threat military force. Never since 2011 have so many key national security leaders so publicly raised the threat of military confrontation if foreign adversaries do not meet America's demands. In other words, America is assuming a more dictatorial tone saying, look, do what we say or else. Hmm, that kind of sounds like that second beast power of Revelation 13. So, what do we know about our current, about the current Pope, Pope Francis? Prior to becoming Pope, he was Cardinal Bergoglia of Argentina. He became Pope after Benedict resigned, which was a historical event because few popes have ever resigned. He was the first Jesuit Pope. And someone asked the question, well, what's a Jesuit? They are the staunch defenders of Catholicism. And Francis was not simply a Jesuit a Jesuit, but he was a Jesuit superior. He was one who supervised the Jesuits. He is considered wildly popular, reaching out to gays, Muslims, and even atheists. He is considered a great politician, one that can bring nations together. One U.S. government official stated the world needs to look to religious leaders, and particularly Pope Francis, to combat extremism in our world. The BBC says in 2016 he is the world's most popular leader. Rick Warren, the one who wrote A Purpose-Driven Life and A Purpose-Driven Church, calls Pope Francis our Pope. Protestants flock to Rome to meet with him. Time Magazine calls him the New World Pope. Now, it's interesting. He became Pope when Benedict resigned. When Benedict resigned February 11, 2013, they're very significant, it was very significant because people were startled that a Pope would resign. However, It wasn't the only story that made news that day because the day Benedict Benedict resigned, something else happened. It was carried by news reports around the world. The day he resigned, what happens? But lightning comes down and it strikes the Vatican not once but twice. And the news news media carries the story and says, is this a sign from God? Here the Pope says he's resigning and lightning comes down, boom, and strikes the Vatican. Then lightning later comes down and strikes the Vatican again. We're reminded in Scripture who does the Bible say falls like lightning from heaven? The, the dragon, all right, the devil. Who is the one who gives the beast his power? The dragon. Is there anything else unusual about this pope, different from any other pope? Pope Francis. Yes, there is. I was talking with a friend of mine who is a pastor, and he was originally from Argentina. And we were talking after Francis became pope, and he says, you know, That man in the Vatican isn't the same man we knew in Argentina. My wife's family lived 15 minutes from him. In Argentina, he was a troublemaker. And in fact, he brought me an Argentine news magazine that this is the cover of it, The Two Faces of Pope Francis. And you can see what he looked like in Argentina as a cardinal and what he looks like as a pope. A drastic change. In fact, his own sister, Maria Bergoglia, his only living sibling, said jokingly, I don't even recognize the guy because he changed so much when he became Pope. According to a report by John Allen Jr. of the Boston Globe, who's considered one of the best sourced and most knowledgeable English-speaking journalists covering the Vatican, he said a a Catholic cardinal came to the Vatican to visit Francis after he became Pope and says, you're not the same man I knew in Argentina. What happened to you? In the report, Francis reportedly shares with him that on the night he became Pope, he had an experience with God a supernatural experience that changed him. Now, we know that old men approaching 80 don't change their personalities. It's not done. Now, God can change them, and the devil can make it look like they're changed. He can masquerade a change, but they're not going to change themselves, not even for money. But here we have a man, the night he becomes pope, has a drastic personality change, and he goes out with power. Marco Politi, another Vatican expert, says this pope seems to be in a hurry to get as much as he done, much done as he can, as if he's got a deadline. He keeps talking about how his time is short. Who else in the Bible does the Bible say is angry because he has a short time? It's the devil, all right? Helen Clark, United Nations Development Program, says he has an emerging agenda on social issues. He is a man in a hurry. 
And what's he in a hurry to do? Meeting with political leaders. Here we see meeting with Castro. Meeting with the Queen. Meeting with Putin. Here he is addressing the leaders of the 27 EU nations. The leaders of the 27 EU nations all come to the Vatican to be addressed by the Pope. Now, what other religious or political figure can draw all the leaders of the EU, of the European Union, all to come to be addressed by them? Hmm. That's a lot of power. Here he is meeting with the United Nations and receiving a standing ovation, gathering the world together around him. But he's also promoting unity with the Orthodox churches. Let's just all get together. Here he is, the Washington Post. Pope urges Lutherans to set aside doctrine to work together. Don't worry about what you believe. Don't worry about what the Bible says. Just let's all come together and work under me. Promoting unity with Islam. Islam and the Vatican. Unity with the Protestants. Even unity with the Waldensians, the group the papacy persecuted probably the most during the Dark Ages. Here he is meeting with 500 religious leaders in September 2016, all coming to meet with the Pope. Now, there's something else interesting that he's been doing in recent years. Not only has he been meeting with all the world leaders and all the religious leaders, he's also been meeting with the leaders of the tech companies of the world. So the head of Google goes to the Vatican for a closed-door meeting with the Pope. Later, it's followed by a meeting at the Vatican with the head of at Tim Cook of Apple Computer goes to the Vatican to meet with the Pope. Here he is meeting with Instagram CEO Kevin Systrom. Here he is meeting with the top YouTube stars of the world all brought to the Vatican to meet with the Pope. And his message to them was, work to bring all the religions together. Here he is meeting with Mark Zuckerberg and his wife of Facebook. Here he is having a summit of, addressing a summit of judges and prosecutors. Judges and prosecutors from around the world are brought to the Vatican to be addressed by the Pope. So not only is he gathering all the world leaders and all the religious leaders and all the leaders of the world's tech companies, but also judges and prosecutors brought to the Vatican to be addressed by the Pope. In December 2016, the Vatican hosted a group meeting of representatives of Fortune 500's top CEOs and Time Magazine's 100 most influential people all brought to the Vatican to be addressed by the Pope and into the context of forging a new social compact. So now you have all the world leaders, all the religious leaders, the world tech company leaders, the judges and prosecutors, and the business people and the most influential people, they all come to the Vatican to be addressed by the Pope. And all the world wondered after the beast. But there's something else interesting Francis has been doing. January 2016, he says, obstinate Christians are rebels. Obstinate Christians who are not open to this, quote, surprises of the Holy Spirit. Now, the word rebel is a strong word. When we think in society, what does society do with a rebel? What do they do with them? You know? All right, the Pope says, if you're a Christian that's not open to change, you are a rebel. He goes on to say, fundamentalism is a disease of all religions. They believe they know absolute truth and they corrupt others. But when we look at fundamentalism as defined in the dictionary, it says a movement in American Protestantism that stresses the infallibility of the Bible, not only matters of faith and morals, but as a literal historical record. If you believe this is the word of God and that it is infallible, you are a fundamentalist. It's interesting, the Pope's choice of words, the saying fundamentalists are a problem, you know. Fundamentalists believe they have truth and they corrupt others. Here in Crux Catholic Magazine, he says, don't listen to prophets of doom. Don't listen to apocalyptic preachers. Don't listen to those talking about the end of time. Now, why doesn't the Pope want you listening to people talking about the end of time? Zenit Catholic Magazine, February 17, 2017, he says, And remember, no people are criminal and no religion terrorists, but there are people out there who are fundamentalists. In other words, it's not about criminals and it's not about terrorists. The problem are the people that believe they have the truth, the fundamentalists. That's where the problem is. Here in Catholic Church News, February 1, 2017, Pope accuses Christians of cowardliness for overfocus on following all ten commandments. Read between the lines. What is he talking about there? You're a coward if you focus on following all ten commandments. 
CNN report, I found this interesting. Why is Pope Francis so obsessed with the devil? Another report I saw said it was his number one Twitter subject. He talked about the devil the most. Now, in the Bible, the Bible <clears throat> society gave the name Christians to Christ's followers in the book of Acts because they always talked about Christ. It was Christ this and Christ that. And they said, let's call them Christians because they're always talking about Christ. But here we have the Pope, and his number one subject is the devil. And the Bible says, who gives the beast his power? All right? And you want, did you see why? That's the one he's talking about the most. It's interesting. In Rome, there was an audience hall called the Pope Paul VI Audience Hall built to hold meetings for popes when they did not want to hold them out in the great courtyard. All right? I'm going to put a picture of the audience hall up that was, it's a relatively recent building. I think it's less than 50 years old or thereabouts. Here it is. And I want you to observe, you know, the shape of the building with the shape of, I put it there, a serpent's head above it with the shape of the serpent's head. And you can see the, the eye of the building there. So you can see it's got a semblance of a serpent's head. But if you might not see it quite so clearly, let's go inside the building and see what's inside if it makes it more clear. So the inside of the building is designed to look like a, the inside of a serpent where you have the eyes and you see the fangs there at the end. And right between the fangs is where the Pope's throne sits. And right behind the Pope's throne, I don't have the picture up, you can go on the internet and look it up, Pope Paul VI audience hall is all you got to do. And if you want to type in statue, look at the statue behind the Pope's throne because it's supposed to be a statue of Jesus rising from the dead, but it looks like some form of angel with a serpent's head rising out of the abyss. And this is sitting right behind the Pope's throne, right between the fangs of the serpent's head. Interesting, last month, March 2018, the Vatican hosted a meeting of all groups, computer hackers, saying gathered computer hackers from all religions and nationalities, all gathered to the Vatican saying, maybe these computer hackers could help us solve some of the world's problems. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Last year, Donald, the Pope met with President, U.S. President Donald Trump. Typically, when somebody meets with a U.S. president, it looks like this there to... The, the meeting is set to, to the pose to present equality. But when the Pope met with Trump at the Vatican, it looked like this. Now, looking at the picture, who does it appear is in charge of the meeting? All right. Now, the newspapers, the media carried the report that it looked like Trump had come for a job interview. All right. What does the Bible say? And all the world wondered after the beast. Now, for those in the greater Protestant world who are looking for an Antichrist to come, thinking, oh, the Antichrist must be some, be some evil ruler that will rise up and do all these things. Now, if you are the devil, what kind of Antichrist are you going to send? Are you going to send something that everybody's looking for, or are you going to send somebody that's like a nice, happy, grandfatherly, says all the right things, does all the right things that the world loves. Nobody would think he's the Antichrist. They're looking for somebody else. And the devil says, ah, oh, I got them. All the world is wondering after the beast, and few know any different because they're not studying what the Bible says. The Bible gives us the light for the day in which we live. Are we taking this book, the Word of God, and applying it on our lives and seeing what's happening? Because in the Bible, the majority is almost always wrong. God's people are a minority. Jesus says, wide is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. And yet we see all the world following after the beast of prophecy in Revelation 13 that we are warned about. And nobody is saying a thing. The final headline we'll look at came after Donald Trump won the Republican nomination for president. It came out of Crux Catholic magazine, and it says this, Trump victory means Pope Francis moment has arrived. Trump victory means Pope Francis moment has arrived. And so we ask the question, 
Where are we in time, brothers and sisters? Do you see the handwriting on the wall? Do you see how close things are going? That it's not business as usual. It's not just another pope like we've had many popes. It's not... No, there's something unique about this time, the time we're living in today, that things are colliding together. We're on a collision course, and events are about to happen that are going to change the way all of us live. And now is the time that you and I need to be earnestly on our knees seeking the Lord, seeking to know his will for our lives, seeking what we can do to further his work, and pleading for the infilling of the Holy Spirit because it's the infilling of the Holy Spirit that will carry us through the troubles that are coming. You remember the ten virgins. Five woke up. Ten woke up. Five had the Spirit and five didn't. We need the Holy Spirit now today more than ever. Revelation 12, 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. In a small village in Zimbabwe, there was, Zimbabwe, there was a young pastor a young Seventh-day Adventist pastor, living with his wife and child. And war came to the country, and soldiers came into the area, and they declared martial law. And as they declared martial law, part of their martial, the martial law was there are no public meetings, and the penalty for violation is death. They would execute you if you hold any public meetings. Now, this pastor had a problem because he had a revival meeting scheduled in another village. And it'd be easy to say, well, just cancel the meeting. You don't want to get killed. But you know how, like, the Spirit comes and convicts you of something you're supposed to do? And this pastor was convicted, I need to go to that meeting. Now, this pastor had a lot to think about because he supported his wife, his salary supported his wife, his child, and his wife's extended family. So they're all dependent upon him. But he knows the voice of the Spirit of God, so he says, okay, I'm going to the meeting. So he travels, he travels by bus over to the other village where they're holding the meeting. And he has a great revival meeting, and the Spirit blesses. And at the end, he says to the people, please pray for me. I don't know what's going to happen when I go back home. But he goes back home, and he gets off the bus, and he's walking towards his house. And as he does so, he notices something odd going on, because people that he knows, they're like turning their heads from him. They're walking across the street to avoid him. They're not saying anything to him. This is kind of odd. What's wrong with everybody? And he gets to his house and he walks in. And you would expect when you're walking into your house, you've been gone a long time, you expect, well, your wife's probably going to meet you there with a hug and a kiss and all that. And his wife, when she sees him, she screams, she grabs her little baby, and she runs down the street to her parents' house. Ooh, this is really strange. But he didn't have terribly long to wait because in time he heard a noise down the street and it sounded like the noise of a mob. And he goes out and he looks outside his door and sure enough, there is a mob approaching his house led by soldiers with automatic weapons and they point and they say, there he is. And they come and surround him and say to him, where have you been? Now, what would you say if you were the pastor? He told them the truth. A godly man will tell the truth. He told them the truth. Here's where I was at. And they says, don't you know that we have a law and by our law, you have to die. So they took that pastor into his house. You know the African houses are the round houses with a pole in the middle? So they took him in there and they tied him to the pole and they told the people, now you go out and you bring in all the dry twigs and leaves and sticks you can and you pile it around him. And the people did just that and they piled it all around him. Then they took lighting fluid and they poured it all over the dry sticks and leaves and, and, and grass and then they struck a light and threw it down and it goes whoosh up in flames and they walked out. The people expected to hear the pastor scream as he burned to death, but instead of screaming, they heard him singing. And this is the song, the words of the song he sang. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. And he sang it over and over until his voice went silent. And then the roof caved in and it was soon it was all over and everything was burned up. And the people went home wondering about the young pastor they had just executed. Well, that night about midnight at the home of the young pastor's wife's parents, where she had run off to, about midnight there was a knock on the door. And they thought, oh no, if they've come for us now, don't go to the door. Maybe if we're quiet, they'll go away. Maybe if we're just quiet, maybe they'll go away. Finally, the knocking stopped. 
In the morning, they got up and they went and they opened the door. And what did they find? Outside, there was the same young pastor dressed in the clothes he had been executed in the day before. The pastor turned and he walks out um, into the center of the village. And by now the villagers are getting up and they all start crowding around him. And the soldiers come and they can't believe their eyes and they're crowding around him. And this is the story that he told. As the flames were burning around him, through the wall came a man in white. And the man in white came and surrounded him that the fire would not hurt him. The man in white then took him out to a place of safety to protect him. As the pastor tells the story to the soldiers and the people, they fall down and they say, please forgive us for what we've done. We are so sorry. Please, please forgive us. You see, in the time of trouble, the young pastor had stood up for Christ and Christ had stood up for him. Brothers and sisters, at, in the time of trouble that the Bible predicts is coming upon this world, if we stand for Christ, Christ will stand for us. Is that your desire today, to stand for Christ? If so, I invite you to sing our closing song with me.